go to Worship Freedom with us online, you're welcome to put a comment on the video link of what you vote for, or you can email me, music at trentonunited.ca, and I'll include those uh, in uh, Cali as well. Thank you. Volunteers are needed, and uh, hospitality volunteers are people who 
who talked just a little bit early and helped the congregation offer a very warm but also a helpful welcome to any who are here, especially those who may be coming in for the first time. And as we move forward to the future of our congregations, it uh, depends not only on everything that those of us who have been around for a while continue to do, but also those new people who we are able to attract and, God willing, keep. Uh, any other announcements that I should be highlighting? Then, there is a minute for mission, and uh, let's have it introduced. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This morning's minute for mission story is titled, Overcoming Obstacles. Your gifts support people building a better future for themselves and their families. Sue, 61, has faced a lifetime of challenges, starting her youth when her mother was involved in organized crime and jailed for fraud. Later, as a young mom, a car accident left Sue with chronic back pain. And last fall, a fire destroyed her Hamilton apartment, forcing her onto the streets. Despite these struggles, Sue has found stability at Mission and Service Partner Wesley. Wesley's special care unit, Sue is working to overcome the drug addiction that she has lived with since she was 11. While the process has been difficult, she is slowly reducing her drug use with the help of her prescribed medications and the support of Wesley's staff. The care unit operates under a harm reduction model, allowing clients like Sue to manage their addictions in a supported environment. Wesley's program is part of a broader effort in Hamilton to address homelessness and substance use. Recently, the program expanded its capacity and now provides 30 beds, that's fantastic, for individuals struggling with multiple substances. Clients are not expected to quit drugs immediately, but are supported in stabilizing their lives, receiving medical care, and reconnecting with family. Wesley's team includes doctors, nurses, and addiction specialists who help clients find their own path to recovery. For Sue, this support has been transformative. Her room at Wesley provides a much-needed sanctuary, offering her a reprieve from the constant stress of homelessness and addiction. She continues to focus on her recovery working in the garden and taking steps towards quitting her fentanyl altogether. Sue dreams of eventually finding her own home and reuniting with her beloved cat, kitty cat, who was rescued from the fire and is being cared for by a friend. Your gifts through mission and service help support people like Sue on her ongoing journey to build a better future for herself and her children. Thank you for the continued support. Sometimes, sometimes as we as we think about and see evidence of the extraordinary needs, the challenges that people are living with, we are persuaded we can easily persuade ourselves into a sense of, of helplessness. Anything I do couldn't possibly matter, except everything that we do, whatever it is, to help does matter and counts. That's I guess kind of what it means to uh, experience and share the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's do that now. God bless you with peace. Our candlelighting prayer. And it is responsive. God of love, you call us to this holy place, situated on the traditional Anishinaabe, Wendak, Neawensio, Mississauga, and Haudenosaunee territories.
The Lord is my light and my salvation, said the psalmist. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. I believe that I shall see the goodness of God in the land of the living. The Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray together. So here we are, Lord. We are waiting for you. And we acknowledge the irony that we have just lit a candle to acknowledge your presence with us, and yet we, we can say, truly, we are waiting for you. We're waiting for something. We're waiting for something that matters to us, in us, so that there will be something good that happens through us. Help us, O oh God, to begin this act of worship with that kind of expectation, daring to believe that you're not only here with us, but that your presence with us can and will, if we let it, <coughs> make such a difference. In Jesus' name, we dare to ask. Amen. God, reveal your presence. I just 
this, uh, is he still shy? Yes. Still shy, are you shy? No, you're not shy. <laughs> okay, this is, this is one of my favorite stories, and it's, Nana's it's got my back. Yeah, I love that. I love that. We need one of those two. Hey, Nana's got my back. Okay, I said, your name is her? Aaron? It's not today. <laughs> so, so, would you consider yourself a, 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 a thespian, an actor? <laughs> you're gonna pretend. You're gonna pretend. But I guess that's what it is. <laughs> okay, so, now you, you know the story of Jonah. Isn't that wonderful that we've done it before? And of course, the best way to do the story of Jonah is to actually act out the story of Jonah. So what we need is a Jonah. So today, Aaron, ladies and gentlemen, introducing Jonah today. Fantastic. And uh, you guys are going to be... You look scared to death. Hey, 
imagine it. Somebody in this boat has maybe even disobeyed God. And Jonah, Jonah who until now has been a bit of a winner. God decided to man up. Right? And he said, it was me. And they said, because that storm was rocking and rolling, and this is, this is, this is my they threw him out of the boat, they threw him out of the boat, and he landed in the sea. They didn't see that. Are you going to come on? Beautiful. Beautiful. And then the waves calmed down, the storm passed, and then we know what happened. I mean, it was, this is the fantastic part of the story, and I was going to get a great big fish, but I just kind of, it was going to be so gooey and greasy inside that I didn't want to do that to Aaron. So, let's pretend that Aaron got swallowed by that big, big, big thing, whatever it was, and then that thing went close to the ground, to the land, and spit him out. So Noah is now safely on dry ground. Dry, dry ground. Okay, Noah, off the deck. Did I say to I just said Noah? Oh yeah, it's another boat. One boat story right now. Okay, now Jonah. Jonah has decided that he could not get away from God, and even though he was still scared, he decided he was going to go to Nineveh, get to those Ninevehs, and those little ones, he was scared. He was scared, but he went to them. And just tell them how bad they are, Joe. It's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try that again. <laughs> what a nice guy. What a nice guy. You're too nice to be, Joe. Anyways, what you are. And then he expected, he expected to tower. Protect. That's right. He expected that they were going to jump all over him and do terrible things to him, but you know what they did instead? When they got the message, they changed their ways. And they became, now this is where you're going to have to act. They became, they became good people. Good people. And they thanked God. And Jonah kind of looked happily ever after. <laughs> Thank you. That was good. And now I think you're going to go out to Sunday school? Is that Sunday like fun? Yeah. You don't have to. You can say the thing that you want, or you can go out with these guys and you're going to have to come downstairs. Is it downstairs or over there? Downstairs. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Anybody else want to leave now? <laughs> We have two scripture readings this morning. The first is Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. 
Then Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. But the Lord said to him, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth, and the Lord said to him, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The second reading is taken from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right. Teacher, you have said, truly said, that he is one, and beside him there is no other, and to love him with all their hearts, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all who whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any questions. Here ends the reading this morning. Thanks, thanks, God.
So let's, uh, let's spend a little while unpacking that, uh, what it means to be known by our love, what it takes to be known by our love, and uh, I'd like to focus our attention on three bits of scripture, three couple we've already heard. Um, we began uh, with words of the psalmist, words of the psalmist, including these, I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And then in the story of Jeremiah, we have that as he begins that uh, 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 response to God's call, what God wanted him to do, God said to Jeremiah, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, for I am with you to deliver you. And add to that this from, from Marx, such familiar words, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and nothing matters more than this. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we reflect on what matters to us, and what ought to matter to us, and what it takes for it to matter in real and practical ways, we pray, O oh God, for the blessing of your Spirit, both in the speaking and in the hearing. Amen. I was, uh, I was honored when Reverend Isaac, uh, knowing that I was going to be uh, filling in today, asked me to offer a final message to complete his series on Christian stewardship. It has been truly said, I'm trying to figure out, what is this stewardship? What do, you, what, what do we mean by that? It's been truly said that stewardship is everything that I do after I say I believe, after I choose to be a disciple of Jesus. In other words, for us to love God and love others as we are commanded, we should be serious about what it means for us to behave like good stewards. And when the testimony of Scripture and the example of those who have gone before, and thank God there are so many before and even around us today, when they reveal what true Christian stewardship looks like, obviously it takes courage. The stewardship resolve of real discipleship is not for sissies. Uh, Bruce Larson writes about a driver who uh, found himself behind a car adorned with the bumper sticker, Smile if you love Jesus. What? That makes sense. That makes sense. And we started smiling like this. And, and everybody was giving him such, such ridiculous looks. He realized that he looked, he looked a, little, a little silly. And then he got behind a car that had a different uh, bumper sticker. This one said, Honk! if you love Jesus. So he did. He got a ticket for making too much noise in a hospital zone. And finally he saw one that said, wave if you love Jesus. And he did. And he plowed into the back of the bus. <laughs> now, according to Larson, the fellow uh, was close to despondency. Oh God, he cried out. I can't smile. I can't honk. I can't wave. How will Jesus know that I love him? And the voice replied, smiling, honking, and waving are easy. If you really love Jesus, tithe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at that. Yeah, 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 that's a typical response. But, you know, that's the, kind of, that's the kind of punchline you would expect from a sermon on uh, stewardship. Preachers have been talking about tithing for centuries, and, and often, to little effect, studies suggest that only a tiny fraction of Canadians who claim to be serious about their relationship with Jesus, who, who, who would describe themselves as disciples of Jesus, make the effort to calculate their giving as a percentage of income. For most of us, 
the only time percentages come up is when we're trying to calculate our income taxes. But I'm not talking about mathematics. The issue is not whether we give back to God 1%, 5%, 10%, whatever, part of our income. What really matters is whether we have the guts, you and I, to face the truth that true stewardship is not the preoccupation of a, of a few religious fanatics, but a sacred obligation for all of us who claim Jesus as Savior and Lord. So let's think again about the story of Jonah. How he was ordered by God to take that gloomy message to the people of Nineveh, knowing that they were uh, not the most polite people on earth. Um, in fact, they were famously ruthless. Jonah was afraid. And that's how he ended up on the ship heading in the opposite direction, at least until the violent storm persuaded his shipmates that somebody must have royally take off their god. And this time Jonah did show courage. He stepped forward to accept responsibility and receive the reward of immediately getting thrown overboard. Although it must not have seemed so at the time, Jonah's courage, Jonah's courage in admitting was rewarded by that incredible lifeguard of the deep that managed to get him safely to a nearby beach. Given a second chance, Jonah then mustered the courage to accept his commission, and he did head for Nineveh, still sure that he was surely going to die, but now believing that Nineveh ire was preferable, <laughs> was preferable to God's wrath. Now for their part, the Ninevans did surprise everybody by having the courage to take Jonah seriously when he announced that God was about to punish their wickedness with cataclysmic devastation. The king ordered everyone to change their ways to start doing the right thing and God rewarded their courage by canceling the death penalty. It takes guts to do the right thing. If someone is telling a racist joke and everyone else is laughing, it takes real courage to say that stereotyping or belittling is not funny. Is not funny. It takes guts to do the right thing. If someone you care about is passing on stories about a person who has become a victim of cheap gossip, it takes courage to say that it's wrong. It takes guts to do the right thing. If you really care about the political party to which you belong, it takes courage to speak against a bad policy or to agree with the opposition when your leader has made a mistake, especially now that power has been so centralized in the office of the premier or the prime minister. It takes guts to do the right thing. Not many backbenchers in either house seem to have much guts these days. If we see in Jesus the way we're supposed to be, the way we're supposed to live our lives and treat each other, if we would be disciples who resolve to love God and each other, then we have to understand that to do that means being good stewards of everything that we have, all the time, and all of the talents, the abilities, and all of the opportunities, and even all of the money. It takes courage to be a faithful disciple, and that courage requires stewardship. Ordinary courage isn't going to be enough. The kind of stewardship demanded of true discipleship must trust the promises of God, must be willing to make sacrifices, and needs to include just the right amount of fearfulness. The stewardship demanded of true discipleship requires a courage that trusts. 
An elderly clergyman was nearing the end of his life, and one day he was visited by a much younger colleague who naturally offered to, to read from Scripture, to comfort the old guy, and on his, maybe on his deathbed, he was certainly close to the end, to, to comfort him by, by reading from Scripture. He said, what would you like to hear, he asked the old guy. And the old man requested chapter one of the first book of Chronicles. And uh, those of you, of course, who have memorized Scripture, know that it consists primarily of genealogies, long lists of names, Hebrew names, 54 verses containing 250 hard to pronounce Hebrew names. <laughs> and he did. And when he was finished, the old guy said, thank you, son. Thank you. That was so comforting. The young guy was amazed. Please tell me, he said, what is it about that chapter that you find so comforting? Ah, oh, said the wiser senior, just to think that God knew every one of them by their name. Courage to do the right thing begins with such a trusting relationship with God that there is no amount of caring, no amount of sharing, however costly, that we cannot dare if we are called and empowered by the one who truly does know our name. There is nothing more empowering than believing in your heart of hearts that there is one who is always watching, who knows the whole truth about everything, and who loves you with a love that absolutely refuses whatever happens to ever let you go. Knowing that God is with us, what is there that we cannot dare to do for God? Now, Jeremiah was a young man who was given a job that terrified him. Absolutely terrified him. Like Jonah, he was commissioned by God to deliver a message which no one would want to hear. How can I do this? Jeremiah knew that he was too young, he was too inexperienced, he didn't have the talent, and he certainly didn't have the courage, but God said, don't be afraid. Simple message. God calls us like God called Jeremiah, and God adds to that, don't be afraid, I am with you to deliver you, to help you make it so, that's the promise in which we dare to put our trust. Whatever the circumstances, we are not alone. Whatever the requirements, we are not dependent on our own devices alone. God is with us. And if we can trust that promise, when we find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death, then surely we can count on God when we are challenged to do the right thing. Now, of course, the flip side of trusting is the risk that we might, we might trust so much that we end up taking God for granted, heaven help us. To make irresponsible assumptions about God's loving kindness would be as foolhardy as the husband who said to his wife, honey, you stick to the washing, the ironing, the cooking, and the cleaning up because no wife of mine is going to work. We can dare to care and share. We can dare to care and share with courage because of faith. Faith that trusts the promises of God to be with us every step of the way. But it is not God who exists to serve us to do what we tell God to do. But we were made and we are equipped to serve God. To take God for granted is not just foolishness. It's the very essence of blasphemy. And therefore, the stewardship of true discipleship requires a courage that is willing to sacrifice. <clears throat> a few years ago, the Smithsonian Magazine celebrated an expert on skunks. There's an expert on everything. This guy, his name was Jerry Dragu, an assistant professor in the biology department at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, and he earned a reputation from his fellow academics for both the science of his research and the courage with which he pursued it. While lesser types took flight whenever one of those white-striped creatures lifted its tail in angry protest, 
Jerry always stood his ground. Great guy. <laughs> Except, actually, Jerry's steadfastness was not so much a function of courage as the fact that he didn't have any sense of smell. He couldn't smell a thing. He couldn't smell anything. In fact, the only price he paid for his devotion to the study of skunks was the isolation he sometimes suffered when his <laughs> friends couldn't tolerate his own stinking presence. What might have been genuine sacrifice for others, for Mr. Dragoon, cost nothing. Cost nothing. The measure of sacrifice is surely what it costs the person who makes it. One of the things that drives me more than wacky, maybe even wackier, some of my friends would say, whenever I hear of it, is how leaders of business and industry are rewarded with massive salary increases and bonuses when they lay off or otherwise terminate workers. The cuts are usually in response to lowering profits or, or maybe just to boost the profits, even if the company's weakness, and we've seen this again and again, if even if the company's weakness is the result of bad decisions by its leaders, they get rewarded when the sacrifice is made by those deemed to be expendable. <clears throat> it's kind of like every war that has ever been fought. The people who make the decisions are not the ones who make the sacrifices, and yet they are so often the ones who are rewarded with, with a bonus or a promotion or, or, or notoriety. But surely the only one who deserves honor in sacrifice is the one who makes it. One of my favorite storytellers is the, uh, the American preacher and teacher of preachers, Fred Craddock. <clears throat> he once said, to give my life for Christ appears glorious. To pour myself out for others, to pay the ultimate price of martyrdom, I'll do it. I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord, to go out in a blaze of glory. However, Craddock was on to say, that's not how true sacrifice tends to work. It's not about going out in the place of glory, the big, the big things. He writes, we think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a thousand dollar bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord, I'm giving it all. But the reality for most of us is that Jesus sends us to the bank and has us cash in that thousand dollars for one dollar bills. And we go through life putting out dollar bills here and dollar bills there. Listen to the neighbor's kids' struggles instead of saying, get lost. Go to a committee meeting. Give a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing home. Usually giving our life to Christ is not glorious. It's not in all those little acts of love, a dollar at a time. It would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life little by little over the long haul. It doesn't take a lot of courage to terminate employees in order to benefit yourself. It doesn't take a, a lot of courage to send others into harm's way, but it takes real guts to live every day, to face every situation and make every decision as followers of Jesus who are resolved to do the right thing. One act of generous love at a time. And finally this, the kind of stewardship required for true discipleship needs a courage that is wise in its fearfulness. There's no doubt that we're living in scary times. Millions of Americans and others are terrified about what will happen after Tuesday's election, whoever is deemed to be the winner. This week I attended a meeting of the Hastings County Council when it received a report about the crisis in our area of crisis in primary care. We heard terrifying statistics about the number of us who do not have access to primary care, either physicians or nurse practitioners, along with how much worse it's going to get, the number of doctors serving in our area who are known to be retiring in the next five years. And then we learned that the Gateway Medical Center, you heard about Gateway? Gateway's a community health center in Tweed. The Gateway, 
Gateway has actually recruited four doctors, four family doctors. Yeah, it would be. Except they can only hire one because it's all the money they have. And they've been begging and pleading, begging and pleading the provincial government to increase their funding because in that model, it's the center that pays the doctor. They don't have the money to pay three more doctors to come in and serve the people in Center Hastings. At the same time, on the same day as I attended that meeting, the Premier was, was boasting about, about the, reduced, the reduced deficit. We didn't spend as much money. And, of course, his pre-election $200 checks. When I see such evidence of our government's unwillingness to do something as simple, as obvious, as shooting and fiduciarily responsible as protecting our health care system, it scares me. Now, when something scares us, when the way forward is risky, we have a choice to make. Individually, in our families, in our congregation, the way forward is risky, right? Of course it is. The odds are against us. The odds are against our congregation surviving beyond the next five, five to ten years. And, and we are right to be scared about the prospect. But when we're scared, we have a choice to make. Will we succumb to the fear, give in to fatalistic impotence, or will we let fear drive us to work harder to do what is right, to try harder to make sure that God's will is being done. In the story of Jonah, there is ultimately a balance between courage and fearfulness. Jonah's first response is only fear. All he cared about was running away. After the storm, his motivations including, included a healthy fear of the Lord, which gave him the courage he needed to face the Ninevans. And for their part, the Ninevans had behaved without any of the constraints that healthy fear might have provided. Only when they faced the wrath of an angry God did they find the courage to do the right thing. Fear, fear without courage is powerlessness. Courage without fear is foolishness. Faith gives the courage to be better and try harder to do the right thing and reach further, reach further for that holy grail of faithful discipleship. The same faith scares us into cautiousness, protects us from foolhardiness, and reminds us that the only thing that really matters in the end is that God's will be done. I have learned, let me end with this, I have learned that in every church there are three kinds of givers. Now, I'm not going to think. There are tossers. Those are the ones who, when they see the plate coming, they reach in to see if they have anything loose, anything that they can spare, anything they know they won't miss. And there are, there are the tippers. The tippers, they are the ones who give with intention, but their intention is based on, on what the church is worth to themselves, how they themselves might benefit. Maybe I'm going to support that church because I want to make sure it's there when I die and I'll have a place to be buried. Thankfully, however, there are also tithers. Those are the ones who base their giving on their receiving, on how much we have been blessed. Whether we are deciding what to say, or choosing what to do, or figuring out what to give. God help us all, every one of us, to be the kind of disciples who are that courageous. Let's pray. Grant, oh God, that we might, as we continue to reflect on words of ancient text, and whatever, whatever I may have said or inspired or thought, bless it, O oh God, so that each of us, as we go from this place today, might 
find a way to move a little closer to that place, which is the will of God. Amen. Uh, in case you need to be reminded, our hymn is today, we are called to be disciples. The words may be unfamiliar, but I think the melody is.
you uh, were told last week uh, by Reverend Isaac um, about the death of Diana Workman and note that the uh, service celebrating her life will be this uh, Saturday at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, also, um, Margaret Lepp continues to uh, recover, please God, from her surgery. Are there any other prayer requests? You can just shout out her name if, if there is one. Lola. Lola? Lola. 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 Let's pray. As we made our way through the chill of this fall morning, oh God, we are surrounded so wonderfully by, by evidence of your creating, of your providence. It's easy to give thanks, even if sometimes our gratitude is, is in the shadow of those other things in our lives for which we feel we feel anything but. Help us, O oh God, to be grateful, even as we ask your help to deal with everything else in our lives. And we ask it not only for ourselves, but for those in our church family for whom this is a day of struggle. Pray, O God, that your presence with them will be as real as it is here for us. And we pray for so many in our community who are struggling in myriad ways, some struggling just to get by, others struggling with, with issues and anxieties, so many types of torment whether it is their own experience or that of loved ones. And we, we pray your blessing, O oh God, on all of us who are feeling afraid today. Whatever the nature of our fear, whether it is a diagnosis or a surgery, whether it is for ourselves or a loved one, whether it is the future of our community or the future of our church, whether it is, O oh God, a fear rooted in, in what is happening in so many places in the world around us in the chaos of our time. Help us, O oh God, not to be victims of that fear, but with your help to use it, to motivate us, to motivate us to draw closer to you, to motivate us, O oh God, to be more and more committed and faithful disciples of Jesus. We ask in his name, even as we pray together. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And I think we will sing once more, but perhaps we'll sing the first and the last verses of God of Grace and God of Glory, Carol and Diane, first and last verses of Hymn 686.
not because we believe God has gone away, but because we know that God goes with us, and we will now be, wherever we are, whoever we meet, we will now be reflectors of that light, which is the presence of God. Uh, there is some fellowship and refreshments downstairs. We'll be out enjoying the kids who have gone ahead of us. Hopefully they've left something. <laughs> that's not the course. You can, uh, you can uh, thank Aaron personally and also the wonderful thespians behind me. And uh, um, also enjoy the fellowship that is ours in Christ. And as you go, go with God who has it will always go. Go in the sometimes risky and always costly footsteps of Jesus, but that's okay. He's the one who saves you. And go in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That's how God blesses us with peace.